You're awesome. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we'll get started with um, talking about the updates that have happened in the system for the last couple months. Um, I think it's been two or three months since we did one of these. Uh, so we'll go through what's new. I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the USAS updates first, and then I'll turn it over to Andrea for the USPS updates. Um, so let's see, so the first thing, there have been some report updates uh, just to the template reports and some other things. So uh, let's get started there. Uh, the first thing, this has been in there for a while, so you may have been in here already, but we did add a link right from the software that goes to the public reports library. So this contains custom reports that the reports working group has been um, working on, reviewing over the past, um, uh, possibly like six months to a year. Um, it's, you know, they've been, um, working on getting these together for a while, and they review everyone and test it, make sure the description, um, you know, suits it and that sort of thing. So, uh, if they click on that link right from the software, there are um, all kinds of report definitions out here and more to come um, that can, they can download the report definition and then import it into the software if that's something uh, that they want. Uh, there also is an example of each one of these reports here, which is kind of nice. It gives you a little PDF version, so uh, as users are browsing, they can take a look at uh, what that report would actually look like. I'm going to hop to the report manager here because there are just a couple I want to point out. Um, one thing that was updated, um, let me filter this down a little bit. Uh, a lot of the re reports had uh, the as of period on it. We've been working um, to clean up some of those uh, parameters on the reports just because on um, some reports, you know, first it was kind of added everywhere. We've reviewed to make sure that it's only on reports where it makes sense. And then the description, so I'm talking about this last, um, this last parameter right here. This description was updated, so it makes it a bit more clear to the user what that actually is doing. So now it's the totals are as of the specific period, you know, and then if there's a date um, specified for like fiscal to date, month to date, that's what it's going to affect. Um, another report that, you know, I know I just hopped to the report manager here, but another one I wanted to point out is this financial summary by fund. That one is equivalent to Classic's fund sum. So that's been added to uh, redesign under those canned reports. And it basically, they can select to categorize by fund, function, or object. Um, there's an exclude zeros option, and then that one um, will mimic that Classic report. Also, while I'm up there, uh, I'm not going to go in here because we kind of talked about it at our year-end meeting, but the 1099 extract, it was uh, updated, the actual tape file, to remove the extra spaces uh, that caused that fixed format to go beyond the position limit. So that is what you, previous, like last year, had to use the truncate option when you were creating your combined 1099 tape file. So that's been updated. Um, so you'll no longer have to use that truncate command uh, when you are amending those files together in Classic. Another thing that we can see right from this report manager is all of these descriptions. So uh, we have, um, had updated this. These are also in the wiki we had uh, sort of a crosswalk and then it had a description for each report. but um, we got this updated so that each report, each standard SSDT report has a description in the software. Uh, we hope this makes it a bit easier for new users coming in so that, you know, they don't just necessarily have to go by the title of that report. They also have a quick little description um, of what will be produced on that report. Some of them include, you know, um, maybe like a sort option, default sorting by vendor name, um, and, you know, some of 
of these are a little bit longer to let you know some things that are included. Amanda, this is Rhonda from HCC, and that description field is, the column's really wide. Would there be a way mm -hmm. to um, wrap the text on that and make that a narrower field? Um, I'm not sure. I can check. Uh, they can, you know, they can drag this, but I know that these don't um, stick, you know, when they come back in the page. Right. So if they're looking for something, you know, they can do that. I'm not sure if it'll wrap it since each one has a specific line, but I can check. Okay, thanks. No problem. Another thing while we're in here, uh, there are some new reports that were added. And let me see. Um, basically, and these were quite some time ago, so you may have noticed. Uh, some of these in here, but we added some reports that go back to that classic rec led program. Um, basically, they were added to be included in the monthly report bundle, you know, make sure that those were available um, if you want to use them. So we have uh, like error corrections and supplies distribution. So that was rec core. Um, there's a budgeting transaction summarized by appropriation. And that was Rec App. Uh, so basically, just kind of filling out that list of Rec Led reports. If you um, want to see what some of those are, honestly, I would probably just look at them in the monthly CD at this point. So, um, but if you do need to produce your own report for those and uh, maybe filter it down or something, those are all available to run as template reports as well. We also added this new one anticipated revenue transactions. Uh, this report is basically the counterpart to the budget transactions. So this would, um, when you run it, and you know, I didn't run this one in advance in this database, so I'm not sure if we'll get data, but we can try. Um, the budget transactions will basically show, you could put in a date range and it would show any budget adjustments, or if you capture the time period where you have your initial amounts, uh, posted to your budgets, and so this one would show any, um, see we have our initial uh, updates for the anticipated revenue to those revenue accounts. If you'll give me just a second, my just lost my notes um, that I had on my other page here. So trying a quick reload. So just a minute. Sorry about this, it'll just be hopefully just another minute. Of course, the one time I didn't email like an additional copy of my notes to myself, then I lose them. So lesson learned. Okay, we're back. Um, let's see. 
All right, then, so the next report that I wanted to talk about, um, this one, not something that you'll need to worry about, but I wanted to, or you know, maybe not right away, um, but wanted to point out is there was an additional RAM export uh, that was added. So um, we worked with LACA, there were some updates that um, they wanted to make to that extract so that it could include, uh, I think it was the created user, it could include the description on the requisition. So for that one, they're gonna work with getting everyone switched over. Um, so right now, everyone that uses RAM is likely, is probably scheduled on that uh, preview on the, sorry, on the previous RAM export report, um, unless maybe you've switched over with them. But if you are still setting up new ones, I would still go with that original RAM export um, until you speak with LACA. They had to make some updates on their end, you know, to get everything ready there. So if you see that updated version, that's why. Um, and uh, though I believe they're going to be contacting ITCs once they're ready to get it switched. The other one that was added here is this user listing report. Um, so I'm going to pull this one up and generate it. This was basically added as a request um, for a counterpart to uh, like a user listing report that people would use for audit. Um, when this opens up, we have it so that certain roles can be excluded. So if um, you only want the district users maybe and you don't want the ITC users to be on there, then you could exclude the administrator roles. And if you only want those that are enabled, um, then you'd be able to put true in there. Or if you just leave it blank, you could get every single user in the system and have a report there. Um, and then it would have the username, um, the full name, and then uh, last login date. It shows the role and a description of the role as well. Um, as far as reports, you know, the other big ad was the report bundles. I know that we uh, talked about the monthly bundle and the payroll CD bundles last week in uh, quite a bit of detail. So I'm not going to go too far into those, but that was really um, probably our, you know, big update that happened within this quarter. So I just kind of wanted to mention it. We added uh, documentation that shows which reports are included in that monthly CD bundle under the report bundles uh, in USAS and uh, there is even a walkthrough of how to add additional monthly reports um, that is in the appendix as well. Oh, and the monthly CD uh, did get another update after it was initially released that included two more reports. So it also includes outstanding purchase order summary and outstanding disbursement summary reports now. Okay, so um, the next place we're going is uh, we're gonna talk about some updates to the AP invoices. And they've been working hard on trying to get everything updated and ready to go with AP Invoices um, redesign page so that we can uh, get rid of that legacy page in, um, in the future and have everything set here. So um, let me go in here and just open one of these up. The first thing um, that I'm gonna mention here is that there was an update to um, populate this received date when the invoice is saved if that's left blank. So um, if I were to go in and enter my information here, say I fill this item. And if I click save, it's gonna take the date, my invoice date right here. If this is blank, it'll populate it and save it in there. 
in a more recent release, since that's happened, we've actually also created a rule that can be enabled um, that will, as an option, instead of taking the invoice date, it would take the vendor invoice date and populate that as the received date instead. So that is, it's one of the invoice um, rules. It's currently disabled, it's not mandatory, uh, but that can be activated if that is, if your districts would prefer the vendor invoice date instead. Yeah, Amanda, I think you've got that reversed. Uh, the default should always be the vendor invoice date, not the, ven the invoice date. Huh. Um, I mean, we definitely had, we had some feedback, you know, that people were wanting that vendor invoice date. So I think probably the reason that the default is not always the vendor invoice date is because not everybody uses that. The, the date's gonna populate to the current date and then um, they could enter the vendor invoice date or not. You know, sometimes they wanna put what's actually on um, that invoice that they received, but I think probably because they just, they don't have to, it's not required. So, um, Think that, I think that's okay, why. Okay, but, but then, but the invoice date is required, so I see that. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But hey, if all of your districts want it, it's as simple as enabling that rule, clicking activate, and it's good to go. So. Okay, so if they enable that rule, then will the the vendor invoice date be required? Um, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to check on that. Um, I don't know that it'll mm -hmm. be required, but you may get some sort of pop up, you know, if it's not. I haven't looked at the rule in too much detail because it's newer, but mm -hmm. I'll make a note and see. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, so uh, let's see the, um, a couple additional improvements that we can see here. So the PO number field up here, you know, this wasn't always actually showing the PO number, so uh, we made sure to update that. So um, that is available. The uh, date shortcuts work too. So there was, uh, when this first came out, it didn't have where you could just type like the two digit dates. So all of your date shortcuts should work normally there now. And then, uh, there were a couple of warnings and errors added. Um, if an amount is entered for an item, so say I had my $500 here, but I didn't have a status and I tried to save this, then I would get a warning. And you also get a warning too. So if I had $0 for the amount and then, um, like a full status, sometimes people will use that to close an invoice, then there would be a warning. Um, I wanna talk about this a little bit because I know that this one um, caused a bit of a stir when, the, when it actually was an error that went into place and then we uh, set out a hot fix to make it a warning so that people could proceed past that. And we had some intended uh, processing um, notes that were on uh, that release, I think it was 28.1. Um, I should have wrote that down, but um, we also have planned next year to actually kind of do a deep dive, have a Fridays with Fiscal where we can talk about AP invoices and processing. But I do want to note that um, some of those intended processing are pretty specific, are specific to zero dollar amounts. Um, basically, the reason this warning is in there is because having, because uh, you, you have your transactions in uh, redesign and everything calculates and runs based on those transactions. And um, it basically, it seems odd to have a transaction that's zero dollars. So you're having an invoice that's zero dollars. And we know that, you know, the intent of that is because you want to close it. Um, but that's why the warning was put in place basically is to say, hey, you know, if users are making transactions for $0, that doesn't necessarily make sense, so are there other ways 
you know, there are other ways that you could potentially do it. And those are what are described in the release notes as um, intended processing methods. Now, because this uh, seems to be pretty common practice, you know, we got a lot of feedback on it. Um, saving this and getting the warning, you know, they can proceed past it. Uh, it is also a rule that can be disabled. So if you have districts that really hate that warning and they do it all the time and they're not going to change their process, you can absolutely disable the rule to even get rid of the warning and it'll operate just how it did before uh, we added that to the system. Um, another thing here, so this one, you know, let me X out and uh, grab one of these that has some more items on it. Oh, Got to go back to my PO grid. So um, one of the things that was updated is that when you open the when you open to begin your invoice now it's going to show all line items uh, regardless if they've been paid on or not i thought i had one i think i must have deleted an invoice in here but if you have um one of these line items that's already been closed it'll basically be grayed out but it'll still show so that you'd still have all of your line numbers here um, you'd still be able to see everything um, that you know is on that purchase order but you'd only be able to invoice the ones that still have a remaining encumbrance. Before it would just only show the lines that could be invoiced. And so it got a little bit confusing if, you know, your PO had five line items and you opened it up and only had two. Um, and then we'll also notice on here that you have a couple more columns. So the original amount um, will show, and, and these were basically uh, set to mimic how this looks in classic, is you'd have the original amount for each line item, your remaining encumbrance, and then your payable amount is the same as your filled amount. So anything that's been invoiced would show in this column. And, you know, I'm kind of disappointed because this is one of the exciting options and I don't know that I'm going to show completely, but um, they, the ability was added so that when I save this, it will pop up um, a window so that I can create uh, another invoice um, right, right from there so you can continuously create invoices. And my database has just um, been a little slow this morning, so I don't want to chance it. So I'm just going to come in here, uh, say that I entered this invoice and I saved it, I would get this create box that would pop up right away um, after I saved one invoice so that I could roll right into creating the next invoice. And one of the cool little features that happens here is whatever PO I was on, so say, see I was on this PO, when I save, if that PO that I was on still has a remaining encumbrance, then it will populate that PO number in my box so that I could use it again. If there's no remaining encumbrance, then it would be blank because there, it wouldn't make sense that I would invoice it again. So that will give users the ability to have their stack of invoices, enter it in, save, they type in the next one, create, and they can just continuously go through the process um, within this AP invoices page, which I know is something that um, quite a few people were missing from before. So I'm really excited that one got in there. Okay, so um, that's about it for what I'm gonna mention with the invoices. Um, Let's go to just a couple of quick things on the vendors page. Uh, the first thing is um, not specific to vendors, but I felt like this was a good place to show it. So the more option here. Now we've had um, 
we've been working on the more option. You know, for a while it wasn't adding the fields and then users were having to manually refresh the page. So that's something that is um, basically with Vaadin that the software runs on. Uh, it's an issue there and once we're able to upgrade in the future to Vaadin 8, that will um, improve the functionality. What we've done for now is basically a way to get around it. So when users have this more menu pop up, they can select whatever they uh, may want to add here or remove. And then once they click the X to click out of this box, it's going to refresh the page and add those columns. So at this point, that was our best alternative is to um, be able to prevent them from having to manually refresh the page. Uh, this isn't the intention that it will always be like this, so just know that because I know that this can be a little bit frustrating when you're adding filters and that sort of thing. So we're working on it, but this is kind of the, um, this is what we've come up with for now to at least make it a bit easier. Um, if they open that more option and don't choose anything, then it won't refresh if they don't make any changes. And um, with this, so I would just, so once you get used to it, I don't think it'll be that bad, update your columns and then go back and put the filters in because if they do put filters in, it would get lost when the page refreshes. The one on the use as side that this is a bit tricky with is the account page. Uh, keep in mind that one has the multiple tabs. So if they're adding something to the expenditure grid, it's going to refresh the page and then they'll start on the fund um, tab again, but they can move right back over to the expenditure grid and go from there. And now that we're in the vendor page, kind of the um, what I actually wanted to show here, um, specific to vendors, is the vendor adjustments, which your users may be working with uh, quite a bit this time of year, depending on you know how they um, enter their amounts for 1099s, uh, this vendor adjustments grid um, pop-up rather has been updated uh, to make it a bit uh, more user-friendly and kind of nicer here. The description field uh, on the grid, so this was extended just so that if there's a longer description that's not too scrunched. And when they create an adjustment, they kind of have more room to move around in here. Let's see, okay. Um, the transfers advances, um, I did have a note that um, we don't necessarily need to look at, but it was previously um, set so that the repay option was only within the current or next fiscal year. And that has been updated so that uh, advances, I'm sorry, that's so specific to advances, can be paid back within any time limit. It's no longer restricted by the software. Uh, we worked with AOS pretty extensively on this to try and determine if there was, um, you know, if that actually was a restriction and they determined that there are times when districts can, um, may need to repay advances longer than that time period. So um, it would be up to the district um, to know how a specific advance is to be repaid. So that's not going to be determined by the software. So just something to note there, um, it, you know, maybe not necessarily that they always should. I think that there is usually it's like a reasonable time frame for advances to be repaid, but, um, you know, they should uh, kind of have that idea on their end, but we didn't want to be preventing people from processing. And then payables, we're getting there. You know, my instance, my instance is feeling the Friday vibe. 
but I was <laughs> trying to uh, get it set before we started today because that's how it goes, you know, when, when we're actually going to be <laughs> looking at it together, that's when I'm, that's when I'm going to have the problems. All right. Um, so here we are. I'll switch over to this detail tab. And uh, one thing that is really exciting, I believe this is what this was in the most recent release that uh, we did improve the performance when you actually post the payables to disbursements. That was a 40% improvement um, to the performance of that actual function. So um, districts that were seeing longer times on posting payables, maybe if they post larger batches, uh, that posting time there should be, um, will be improved. The other thing on here is the payment due date was added to this detail grid. So again, something that not all districts use, but if your districts do enter a payment due date to sort of batch their payables together, they would now be able to use that column on the grid. They can filter by that and then, you know, maybe select all those records and post them together. All right, and last thing I'm going to show on the USAS side here is uh, the distributions and error corrections. So um, if they are entering an adjustment in here, we had requests to add the option to print this to a PDF. So that option is available right on the grid. They have a little print icon. Um, I believe that what basically uh, what people wanted it for is when they're entering, they'll enter that, and then they just wanted to basically have something to print to be able to um, put with their paperwork, you know, for audit reasons, basically just a paper trail of that adjustment that they did to uh, show that it was complete. So this is very simple, um, just gives the district information, the description of the error correction, and then the account and showing that, you know, it, it balanced out to zero. Yeah, um, Amanda. Yeah. I, I suggest that you put the the user ID or something on there that that shows who processed that. Ah, uh, okay, like the created user. Right. Okay. Yeah, let me make a note of that. I wonder if that's on the transaction. I'm sure it's. Okay. Well, thank you for the feedback. Yeah, I will we'll make a note of that, and um, we may need to uh, make a feedback issue for that one, because um, then, yeah, probably because they're, if they're printing it for their record, then they can show I did this or that sort of like who did the adjustment. Makes sense. Any other questions before uh, we head over to the USPS side? Okay, well, um, I know that this one is a bit longer today um, since we are doing updates on both sides. So I think uh, maybe we'll take like a five minute break to get switched over and then that way if anybody needs to, um, you know, take a breather real quick and um, I don't know, Andrea, what do you think? Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I hope everybody can hear me. And what we'll be going over is just a couple of the juror issues that have been out there um, that we haven't gone over since I think the last time Lori did. So we'll go ahead and the first one that we're going to be going over is way back on 5.36. And this one would be, um, all right, so a couple of them that we've done. Let's see. 
4281. Um, the users want to override, um, to ignore the employer distribution flag. Um, so that's been added in the configuration. And if you go to configuration and you'll be able to see and probably retirement share, and now you have that option if they want that to only in, um, employer distribution accounts to be included on the reports or not. So this is where that option has been added. The other one that's out there is the benefit accrual convert personal leave. And let's see, 4492. Um, there was something that was going on, um, and that was a bug, um, where the payroll account percentage did not equal 100%. Um, it was not catching it um, soon enough, so they go ahead and they did a fix on that one. The 3457, and we did an adjustments. Um, and items imported from classics um, cannot be deleted anymore. So they put, uh, they took that button away. So now when you go into adjustments, um, you're not able to delete any of imported items that came over from classic. So they took that option away. In the 5.361, um, the only thing I was gonna go ahead and re um, mention here is that they added a order of the state report and if you go to reports and go under auditor of the state they have now two new options here to run these reports for um, AOS and here you can put your beginning ending date and you can generate it by payment history or by payment distribution and this is all by a CSV report so that was the only one that was on um, the 5.361 release On the 5.362, we had new contracts imported, um, can now find old compensations. They had a set day prior um, import, so when districts were trying to import, um, it wasn't finding all the new contracts from old compensations, so they went ahead and updated that. So now they can find old compensations that have the stop dates prior to that import. So that was what this was release was for. On the 5.37, um, had a couple bug fixes and new features. Um, we won't go over all of them. Um, the main ones probably would be the payroll archives, the replacements, in the current day, and they, if you go to rep, uh, reports, or excuse me, and they added all the new, um, the archives are now included. So when you run your payroll, run certain reports. And as you see, you can see that um, there's different Every time they run a payroll, um, you would have your payroll information, your paper reports, employer distribution. Also, let's see. Um, the 5.83, this one was determined what um, report should be included in um, the payroll CD. And what we did in our payroll here under archive, I included a, created a sheet that you can actually print off. And what this does, um, you can see these are all the reports now that when it's triggered, um, what events trigger them and what the name of the event triggered. And so we listed all these, um, so we have them for ACH submission. We now have it for benefit accruals. So if you run your benefit accruals, you have all these reports that will go out there. And these will go out to your the, um, archive. So you can go ahead and take a look at those um, at your convenience. 
but I think they pretty much hit them all. So this is a really nice new feature. So it kind of takes over the payroll CD from what we had in Classic. Okay. See the next one. Um, let's see. I think the other one that they were talking about was 4366. And I think we want to do. I don't see that one in here. Oh, I jumped. Sorry about that. Wow, I did, didn't I? Um, I must have hit the wrong button. The least sick by, um, is the option is not selecting correctly. This was a bug that this is fixed. Um, so this one would be if they were the contract start date, um, the compensation, um, what it was looking at. So that was corrected on this release. On the 3379, they had a the check SGRS advance report. Um, this was a, just an update, um, update to sort by name. So they updated that. So now it will be changed and it will go by last name, first name, and middle initial is the order. So they went ahead and updated that. So be name, stop, date, and code will be now on the check STRS advance report. So that was just a minor update that they did. Uh, the other one that uh, was a concern was uh, 3871, and this was just uh, import absence data 3821. Right on here. It was import absences. Um, I guess when they were doing um, employee districts were doing import absences, um, they were able to delete these from the import. And now they took that option um, to be away. So they cannot delete those absences anymore. Oh, 38, there it is, 3821. So they took that option away from, because the history could, um, could mess up with the history. So they didn't want that to be able to be deleted. Okay. The next one is our 5.38. And we had a couple of different ones on here, bug fixes and new features. Um, the error, one of them was the errors on the payroll post error report. I think this was a big one where districts were running their payroll and initializing and they were getting, um, the errors were not coming all at once. So then they had to rerun it and then another error would pop up. So now that was fixed on the 538. So when they run, all the errors should now display on the payroll error report. They shouldn't just have one and then have to rerun it, pay report, rerun again, and it was time consuming. So they went ahead and fixed that. So that's gonna be a nice feature there. Okay. And the next one Well, let's see, five point three, what was it? These were just bug fixing um, for the 5.38. Um, some, they were having some issues with certain people couldn't run the ACH submission file, so that was fixed. They found uh, what that was for that issue. Um, on the 5.38, they had a, a account sync issue that was um, preventing it from completing. So that was just a quick fix on the 5.382, so that is now fixed. And jumping to 5.39, um, we did have some errors um, that were costing on the po payroll post, uh, was due to leave eligibility flags. Um, that was a bug that was fixed, so that no longer will be a concern. And see. Um, on the benefit um, obligation, employee benefit, um, this report was allowing terminate and deceased positions to be included on the report. And so they went in and fixed that bug and now employees with active um, and not terminated or deceased would not be included on that anymore. 
Okay. Um, new features, we pay report when initialized in payroll. Um, they have the current and future. This is another new one that they added. I'll go to payroll. I have here all in the documentation has been updated to date. And now when they look on the pay report, this was uh, something a lot of districts asked for. So now they have the total current, total future gross, and the total gross of everything. So this was a new feature that was added. And I think this um, helps with the balancing for sure with the districts. So I just wanted to show that. Okay. And that was a 5.39. Okay, I think that was it for the 5.39. That was really anything big. On the next one, um, here they just did a bug for the 5.391 um, for the ODJFS. So this was not really concerning anything. So it was just something for districts that were larger than 101. Um, the report um, was not including everybody. So that was a fix on that one. On the 5.40, which was back in October 11th, um, he did some bug fixes for this one. All right. Um, they did a bug fix that the employer rate on payroll items was uh, scaling to four digits. So they fixed that. Some of the enhancements and new features. Um, now you're able to archive many of the core options. So if you want to hide these employees but not delete them, um, that is now included here, include archive and archive button here. And one of them that was added was archive payees. That was the one that was released on 5.40. So now they can um, ability to archive the payees. So that way they don't have a whole list. And if they don't use them anymore, they can hide those from view. It does say delete, but it is an archive option. They're, they will still be there. And then you can just go ahead, include archived, um, include archive objects, and then those would bring those back on here. Okay, the next one. Andrea, can yes. I um, make a, a suggestion? Yes. Um, districts love that option and it's really cool, but the box to automatically include those is by default, unless I'm missing something is checked. So they have to uncheck that every time in order to hide those that they've already concealed. You mean the included archive box up here? Yeah, by default that's checked. Okay. So they're hiding, you know, they're concealing them, but then when they go in, that box is automatically by default checked. So it's including those that they've hidden. Okay. Which kind so of when they go into the, the purpose app, of. So they would like to see that to leave it checked every time they go in there instead of having to click it every time? No, by default it is checked. Okay. So it's including the concealed employees. They don't, okay. They've hidden them, so they don't really want to see them. So they're having to uncheck it every time they go in. So by default, if it could be unchecked to not include concealed employees, which is the reason they probably hid them in the first place, that would be helpful. Okay. I can let Mark know on that. Is that, I don't know if I made sense. <laughs> Is it is it in like any of the core options, or um, are we talking about concealed compensations? Um, sorry, I was in payees. Let me go to compensations. Okay. So in this one, you're stating that it automatically. So when you go in, it checks that include um, archive. Oh, it does? Okay. Well, it was for our districts, unless okay. there's something that was- That changed? We don't have set up, but that okay. box was being checked every time. And so they would have to uncheck it to like 
hide those. Hide those employees. Okay, I will ask yeah. uh, Mark on that to see um, what what's going and on I don't with know why that. It mm -hmm. Didn't do that for you because <laughs> you logged um, out and logged back in, and I'm like, okay, that's weird because <laughs> you know they're they're hiding them for a reason, and then we're um, having to uncheck that box wasn't really. Okay. It was one more step that, you know, I thought that they would have to do. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, I All definitely right. will let um, Mark know when we'll go ahead and look at, um, see what's going on with that. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks for letting us know, Lori. Okay. So, let's see the next one. Uh, the new one would be, um, a new option was the add the ability for adjustment journals, create new, 4679. And this one is, if you go to adjustments, and once it goes, there it goes. So once you go in there and you do create, now they have the option where you can create new and just create keep creating without having to close the box, save it, and then have to create a new one. So this is just a, a new enhancement that they included, so that way you did not have to exit out and go back in and create new, um, edit, create a new one. So now they can just, if they know they've got to create um, 10 of them, they can just create that new box and go ahead and just keep adding a new employee, save it, keep adding the next employee. And then once they're done, they can go ahead and click out and close, or they can just click the cancel button, either or. So that was just an enhancement that was requested by the district that they added. Okay. So the next one. And we're 5.40. Oh, I think we just did 5.40. Yeah. There was um, the STRS new hire, um, 4684. Um, this one is where the phone number was causing issues. This was a bug that they fixed. Um, they took out the dashes, so when they're entering, they don't want uh, they don't want the STRS new hire to have that. Um, so for now, they took that out, and now it will show with no dashes, no slashes, no nothing on that. So they fixed that bug. And I think that's it on that one. Okay, so 5.40. On the 5.41, again, they had quite a few um, bugs on this one, or excuse me, not on the 4.1, sorry, uh, 4.1 on. This was just bugs that they went ahead and fixed. And then the next one, the 5.40. Again, this was a, um, two bugs that were fixed and a new feature. And nothing really to go over on these. Um, the one they did, users wanted a budget distribution report to be an output of CSV, so they did add, um, add that, and they also added the option for payroll account distribution um, to be added so they can run that as a CSV. So those are two new enhancements that they um, added for on the 5.40.40.2. Okay. On the 5.41, here we have a, quite a few bugs. Um, most important ones, I would say, is um, it fix, um, allowing advanced sick leave adjustments to be only two decimal places, so they went ahead and fixed that. Um, they also had a bug out there that was allowing a user to post the payroll twice, maybe two people were working on the payroll and um, it was allowing them to actually post the payroll twice. So they were able to get that one fixed in this release. Um, there also was a bug out there for ODJFS and W2 report. Um, what it was doing, it was excluding, excluding deleted employees with wages. So they might have been um, employees that were concealed or something, and then they were not actually putting them on these two reports. 
so they had to go ahead and fix it. So when ODGFS and W-2 reports, and if they had income, they make sure that those were included. Um, the other one, the bug that they fixed was an afford report, which re preventing employees paid on the pay payroll, um, and then also it lagged from being included on the report, so they hadn't fixed the afford report on that one. Um, the enhancements they did on this one, um, this is when they, they actually, the SDRS tax constant is now a minimum of salary to 30000 for SDRS changes. So that is now updated in the system. Um, also, there was an improvement. So when the, um, the districts run wage obligation report by account, um, make sure to look at the auto history and they want to find active accounts based on the user enter date. So they went ahead and create, uh, fixed that. And anything else? Um, no, the features, which Lori had talked about, the kids seal compensations, that was added on this one. And okay, so that was it on 5.41. And then on the 5.41.1, um, Looks like it was just some invalid um, account code issues on that one. Okay, so next on to the 6.0 release. Um, compensations, um, archive compensations. Um, they had a 4739. So they had the ability for the user's archive compensations. That was an improvement made. And as of right now, they can't, they should be able to, let me see. Yeah. So they do have the archive to be included, okay. So they did have some for, um, so they looked over which ones, archive compensations, um, if it's not eligible to be paid, um, they updated the payroll service to allow, uh, not allow the archive compensations to be paid. So that was updated. And let's see. And then they also included on this one is where the payroll reposting, um, what reports would come over to the archive. Um, this is when this one was added for this um, release. Okay. Um, the next one is the 6.0. Um, they did just fix some bu um, bugs on this one for um, payment printing that was adding, it was tra trailing zeros to the year-to-day amount. And they also fixed a bug that was found in the afford report. So they went ahead and got those two bugs fixed. And the 6.1, oh, 6.2, excuse me, I'm jumping. Um, they fixed a bug that was in SERS reporting, um, was related to a, a divide by zero exemptions. Um, in a, a report when they were running this district was getting a zero error report. So they went ahead and they fixed that on this release. And the 6.10. They did some bug fixes on this one for the ODHS report. Um, it was pulling the historic employee's name from for the report. And I think it was mostly for um, people that had the estate of for deceased employees. Once they changed that back on the employee screen and running ODGFS, it was still trying to pull in uh, the state of the employee. So they went ahead and fixed that. So it always look at the name and not what was the last historical event. So, and that was just a quick bug fix. Okay, we got some feedback here. Go ahead and try to delete or to 
if I can put that person on hold. Not sure who has the feedback on that. Andrea, I believe it's uh, user 21. User 21, okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Got it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We'll continue on. Um, also, they had employer di uh, direct deposit. Uh, jobs were feeling if uh, the name was longer than 150 characters. So that was a bug that was updated. Uh, the attendance view that would now allow the user to select a blank substitute if one was already selected. So when they were, I think, believe in current or future, when they were adding a substitute, when they were adding uh, a payment, um, it would not let them um, change it. So it would just keep adding the next employee and then the, uh, on the next current line on the current or future. So now they're able to select a blank line before they were not able to do that. Um, I guess there was a bug with the payroll item detail report, which is causing the formatting, odd forming on the summary totals page. So they were able to, they got that fixed in this release. Um, some improvements, um, the payroll archive um, will now source uh, submission files along with reports. And again, I included that. Um, so when now when they run any um, thing with submission files, they also have that option that they're still out there. So they will go to the payroll archive. And I included that on here. So now you can see like ACH submissions, those would be ACH file. Um, those submission files are now still gonna be out there. So they can go to their file archive and still be able to get and create a submission file um, if they need that submission file again. And the ones we have out there so far, like I said, I uh, listed on there, ODGS reporting is one of them, ACH, and STIRS and SIRS. So those are ones that have been added. So now those are now out there. Once you run those, those will always be out there in your archive. Okay. Um, they did an improvement on the user listing reports. Um, I guess they wanted um, our, the payroll to match what the USAS version was. So they went ahead and got that updated to match. Um, a new feature that was added in this release would be the State of Pennsylvania electronic submission um, for ITCs that are, um, have Pennsylvania employees. So now on the W-2 report, Maybe, here we go. Um, we have W2 state options, and now we have them, now they're available to run, generate Pennsylvania for your W2 submission or CSC transmittal file. So that is new for this year's W2 processing. And, and then another one that was just updated under compensations they can now adjust pays paid. So if we just go under our employee here, and then down here in the create, you can see now that pays paid has been added. So now you can do amount paid, amount earned, doc, pays paid, days worked, and those are, that was a request. So that is a new feature. So that was it for the 6.1. Okay. On the 6.1.1, um, we had a couple bugs and new features added. Um, a new feature was uh, the ability to mass load pays paid when loading compensation adjustments. So that was an option that was added in the mass load for um, loading compensations adjustments. And again, um, our mass load documentation is always out there for if you have any questions on that under utilities and mass load. And then we have listed of all of them that are listed. So, okay. All right, on the 6.2, 
two. Mm, did I jump? Maybe I jumped one, sorry. No, I didn't. Okay. Mm. Okay, so 6.2. Uh, the latest one here, which was just done on December 9th, um, with new features, um, they added the new State of Ohio 2020 tax table, so that has been updated. Um, they did do some fixing of some bugs. Um, let's see, they did employee master report. So they had a issue with that, and an exception being displayed to the users when they ran that. Um, the Ford report, they were having some issues with that with the start and stop dates. The filtering was in excluding pays that should be reported. And also um, the search for adjustment journals, which was based on transaction date and not posting date. So now it's as whatever date they posted is what their Ford adjustment journal. Um, so that's what the Ford report will look at now and not the transaction date. And let's see. Um, they did some improvements, which was for the payroll on posting. Um, again, the payroll posting when errors were occurring, um, the performance, I think, because it was running a, a little slow when it was um, doing this, so they made some improvements so it runs a little quicker. And I think that was it for here. Um, let's see. I know they had a pay a pay amount subtotals on the pay report. Um, I do believe there was some issues with how the column width was not um, long enough, so they had to um, make an adjustment for that. I believe that is it on our, our releases for payroll. Um, is there any questions or anything that you want to go over? Okay. Um, if there's not any other questions, I think I believe we are done for our today for Friday. Um, I do, I just want to make one comment. Uh, this is Michelle. Yeah. Uh, we are going to be um, posting some more Friday webinars for the beginning of uh, next year. Um, we are going to have a different uh, registration page. You guys won't be going to the old SSDT archived website in order to register for trainings. We're going to have a training page out here on the wiki. Um, and then you will be the registration format is going to be a little bit different. So once we get everything scheduled and squared away, we will be sending out an email message to all you guys with the steps on how to register for a Friday webinar. Um, and also I wanted to let you know too, we are planning this spring to also do um, a more um, detailed training, uh, like an overview of the USAS system on, and the payroll system just like we did last year. Um, we're planning on scheduling that mid-March. So we'll be going with the same format that we have before where we did um, like a three-day training and it was just in the mornings for like a three-hour block. So we'll be doing three days in the morning for payroll and then the next week, three days again for USAS. So that will be out there too on the registration page once we get that set. So again, look um, for an email from us close to the end of the year here with all the registration and Friday and training uh, information. Thanks everybody and have a happy, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you very much.